We begin in Davos, where Nigeria's Minister of State for Petroleum Resources Oil, Heineken Lopoberi, says Nigeria loses nothing when international oil companies like Shell sell onshore assets to focus on deep water oil fields. The minister spoke to Dr. Ruben Abati and Rotus Oderi in Davos at the ongoing World Economic Forum. Let's take a look. Nigeria is more of a gas country. We have adopted gas as you know, a, a transition fuel. There's tremendous interest in our gas you know, assets you know, as a country. But the point has to be made that we can't transit at the same time. If you can recall, the UK last year gave over 100 licenses for you know, fresh or new exploration in the North Sea. As we speak today, America is the highest producer of fossil fuel. There is no country that is consciously trying to stop production of fossil fuel. But that is for another day. But my own is that this trip afforded us, afforded us the opportunity to interact with a couple of people who have shown interest to invest in cleaner energy. And we have told them that Nigeria is ready for investment. Government will not invest. Government can only, you know, uh, create an enabling environment for businesses, for companies, you know, to come and invest. And so many companies have indicated an interest, you know, to come and invest in our gas, you know, um, infrastructure, particularly to supply Europe. Do you want to name some of those companies that have showed interest? Well, we may not necessarily name the companies. I may not have all the companies, you know, but a few companies, you know, have indicated interest. And, you know, we, we feature it in different panels. Those panels basically have companies and then institutions, financial institutions. Yesterday, if you could recall, in our meeting, you know, um, uh, where the VP also attended, I made mention of... Uh, the president of you know Africa Finance Corporation who also attended one of those meetings. And all of them, you know, are thinking about how they can attract funding, you know, um, to Africa, particularly to fund, you know, our own energy transition. But for me, those pledges, promises can't take us anywhere. We need real investment. I mean, I, I recall that, you know, so many countries have been saying they want to, you know, um, they are making pledges, you know, to commit thirty billion dollars, twenty billion dollars. There has been no redemption of those promises. And I know that there's no way we can, as a country, rely on those promises. We want investment in cleaner energy, which is gas that we have in abundance. And they're going to show you that so many companies are interested in coming. Honorable Minister, I wanted to ask you about um, comments we took from you earlier in the month where you said that Nigeria could possibly produce as much as 2 million barrels per day of, uh, of oil. The budget has a number of 1.78 million barrels. We only did about 1.4 in the third quarter of 2023. In the second quarter, we only did about 1.2. We haven't even met our OPEC quota of 1.5. So what gives you the confidence we can hit 2 million barrels per day this year? Well, the good thing is that you know, OPEC doesn't um, doesn't calculate condensate. Condensate is also, you know, high-grade crude. And it's even more expensive than, you know, the bunny light, the other crude, you know, that we sell. And uh, let me say it categorically that we are doing maybe 1.4, 1.4 something. So if you add the condensate of 350,000, we're already surpassing, uh, you know, a figure that's budgeted in our budget. So. We are not difficult in you know, meeting what is contained in our budget, but I also want to say that our temporary inability to produce two million barrels of crude has nothing to do with capacity. It's because of you know the problems we have with insecurity and our aging, you know, infrastructure, and we are doing whatever we can to attract you know investment in that sector. Well, let's talk about Shell, the Shell sale of uh, onshore assets. Now, they talk about possible sale of onshore assets has been on for quite a while. So what do you think is the strategic interest of Shell at this time? Well, you know, most of the IOCs are more interested in going deep offshore, if you recall. You know, deep offshore is the exclusive, you know, um, um, arena for, you know, the IOCs, where it requires you know, tens of billions of dollars. The independents, I mean, those uh, uh, local players may not be able to, you know, um, raise such huge funding. It also comes with less community problems. And so Shell, that has been in Nigeria for, you know, um, as long as you and I can remember, and uh, the other IOCs are more interested in going deep offshore so that they could, um, you know, operate at that level. No company is willing to leave, not even A and I, is willing to leave Nigeria. No country, no company has said that, look, we are leaving Nigeria, you know, totally. But most of them are interested, you know, in um, divesting from, you know, 
onshore and shallow water you know, assets because they felt that it's, it's better for them to operate in a deep offshore. We lose nothing. I can also tell you today categorically that the local players have also developed so much capacity to an extent that they can acquire these assets, run them professionally, profitably, and so Nigeria doesn't lose anything. In fact, in my opinion, this is another opportunity we have where if these local players, you know, um, when they take over these assets and operate them, how money will stay in our country as opposed to the IOC taking their money abroad. But so it's also, it's also an opportunity. We lose nothing in terms of jobs, in terms of accruals to government. We lose nothing. But, but isn't it also, you mentioned community issues, isn't there security and, and the oil, you know, vandalism issues that are pushing them off from the shallow, shallow areas? And isn't that, a, you know, a, a cause for government to clamp down on those vandalism issues and um, other issues that are pushing them off, you know, to, into deep water? Yes, yeah, we government, you know, is not, um, you know, um, resting at all on its responsibility of trying to, you know, bring criminals to justice. But we, it has to be a multi, you know, pronged approach, and that is why we have, you know, the civilian, you know, security, you know, um, contract that was awarded some years ago. We are also renewing it, and uh, that has the little increase you have today is based on the collaboration between the civilian security, you know, um, um, operators and the government security, you know, uh, agencies. And I can also assure you that, you know, there's a difference between a local operator and as it were, or you operator. You know, when you see, you know, if they see you, they see you as their own. And so I believe that if you look at um, the success we have recorded from, you know, the local companies, which are very strong, you see that they have less community problems. They know how to deal with those communities better, and we're yielding the desired results. An NPC, I just want to really quickly ask. Um, you know, with there was the sale of mobile assets to Seplat. NNPC had the right of first refusal. Um, not sure if that has been completed. Would there be any? Um, I mean, NNPC would they have the right of first refusal to possibly hold up this as sale of assets for Shell as well? Well, I don't want to speak for NNPC because I'm not the spokesman for NNPC. But I, also, I can also tell you that NNPC also reports to me, and I don't have any indication as at this moment as to whether that kind of thing will happen. And so maybe if you see NNPC, you can talk to them. But I can also tell you that the Seplat mobile transaction, you know, uh, which um, uh, was truncated in the last administration, has been 99% resolved. I brought the parties together. We've had a series of meetings, and we have agreed on the terms. So it's just for the NNPC board to sit, approve the terms of the settlement. Seplat board to sit, approve the terms of the settlement, and that matter, you know, will be over. I know that it was a big disincentive you know, to, um, to, the, to the IOCs to make further investments. And so when I brought them together, we have resolved. We have disagreed to agree, and so that matter is resolved. And under my watch, I'll do whatever I can to see how that kind of situation do not, you know, arise. If any piece had any reason to, you know, invoke the right of, you know, first refusal, I have also told them to indicate it on time. So you don't allow parties, you know, to negotiate, you know, up to the final point before you say, look, I'm interested. We have to do things, you know, differently. And this government is willing to, I mean, do things differently, you know, uh, so that we can get the results that we desire as a country. Okay, let's talk about Angola. Angola has pulled out of uh, OPEC, and Angola is likely to ramp up its uh, production and probably also get the uh, support of some OPEC plus uh, countries. Now, what is Nigeria doing to hedge our bets so that we don't end up holding the short end of the stick? Yeah, you know, Angola joined uh, OPEC midway. Nigeria is one of the founding members of OPEC. And um, I know that we have concerns, you know, like Angola, but it's better, you know, for you to stay in the house and address those concerns than going out. I tried to talk to my counterpart in Angola to say, look, don't leave OPEC. Stay in the house and then continue to argue, you know, uh, within, you know, um, uh, the OPEC in you know, the family. But it's a sovereign country. Is their prerogative to decide it, and so they decided to leave. We will not leave, but we will continue to make a point. I have already, you know, um, uh, made the case, and we'll continue to make it. We are not satisfied, you know, with the quota that was given to, to us, and we are saying that we deserve more. And, and, and they are saying that, look, we will continue to negotiate, we will continue to talk. We are not going to be so changed at any point in time. The last meeting we held where Angola objected and eventually left was a meeting of OPEC plus. So either you belong to OPEC or you belong to the other, you know, that group headed by, by Russia. 
And so either way, one way or another, you must belong to either OPEC or the other group. And the other group to have their own concerns. And everybody's more interested in price stability, higher prices, not just, you know, the quantity that you produce. If you if overproduce and the price goes down, you don't get any more economic value. So we are not going to be changed at all, you know. But we'll play our politics within the OPEC family and uh, get what we want. Honorable Minister, just, I'm going to have to wrap up soon. The Portacot refinery, what's the update on production? I know we took a tour recently. We covered the tour where you were looking at the rehabilitation efforts. When can we say Portacot refinery will be coming back on stream as far as you know, production is, is concerned? Well, you know, if you, if, you see, if you see the cockpit of, you know, of an aeroplane, there are so many buttons there. It's not like a vehicle where you just start and then you start moving. Each of those buttons has one use or the other. If you go to a refinery, there are millions of, you know, buttons there. But what I can tell you is that Podakot has three, you know, trains, and they say train one, I mean, the, which they call the Area 5. It's mechanically completed. It flares are up. And so I believe that, you know, um, within a short time, I don't want to give you specific time because I don't want to lie to anybody. So we hold you to that. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> but I can assure you that since the mechanical you know, aspect is completed, the train one will soon, you know, come on stream. And uh, the, other, the other two trains are still undergoing rehabilitation. And uh, I believe that by the end of this year, all of them will come on stream.